Thank you, Andrew. So, Rob and I will share this presentation. I'll do a bit of a quick intro, but the main thing you're probably interested in is the, the Perigy Protocol, which is uh, pretty new for the industry. But I'll give you a bit of background on what the, the project is and what, from a council perspective, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, do an intro, objectives, upstream catchment, and then you're probably more heading into what Rod's going to talk about. Uh, so that's showing on my screen, but not yours. Okay, uh, sorry, I need to work out what's going on here at the screen behind. So the catchment we're talking about is um, Carlton. Uh, so CBD down here, and uh, um, the museum's over in Carlton Gardens. Uh, Lincoln Square is next to Burberry Street there, underneath uh, Melbourne Uni. Um, and the next one has the... Um, square on it of the catchment roughly uh, where the, um, the water comes from and we're uh, flowing to. And the reason we're doing the project, um, there's a little bit of local uh, flooding but not so much, but definitely it rushes down. So it's pretty much a, a hill to Victoria Street and there's also a gradient down this way and this way and it all ends up in Elizabeth Street which used to be an old uh, creek line running into the Yarra but uh, even before the white folk got here it was uh, meandering um, uh, creek, a femoral creek, but uh, would flow very slowly from where Big Market is down to the river, and it still kind of does that because it's it's quite flat and there's a huge drain underneath here. Uh, this last section is is relatively good for one in twenty year standard, uh, but going back up, it, it's not. Um, and there's some images of in the seventies it flooded uh, uh, a lot, and in the last five years it's flooded a couple of times, not to um, Getting into the properties, but certainly on the uh, on the road surface and inconveniencing um, uh, the road users, but mainly the trams. So short, sharp events, uh, steep hill, running fast off the catchment into a, a fairly flat area. So what we wanted to do um, in terms of we wanted to get a, a flood reduction and try to get to a one in twenty year standard through throughout the system. Uh, it's a very built up area obviously being the CBD and this is one of the few locations that we had some open space to work with uh, and a reasonable size drain next to it. So we've got a flooding issue, we also uh, have a, some targets around alternative water use and using uh, use, uh, for irrigation. Uh, so we try trying to combine the two. So we've done a number of stormwater harvesting projects in, in the, the city. Most of them are pretty close to the bottom of the catchment. This is the first one that's relatively close to the top, sort of uh, top to halfway down, uh, and gives us the opportunity to try out this flood mitigation and doing the two together. Uh, so the catchment, 37 hectares, mostly uh, Melbourne Uni, um, and one of the interesting things about that is, it, I'm kind of giving the game away, but in the end we couldn't fit enough water here, uh, but if Melbourne Uni do, do some work within their catchment, between the two of them, uh, two, so multiple systems, a bit like the, the previous um, talk about rainwater tanks. There's a, a large version of rainwater tanks, but uh, Melbourne Union have two tanks in their catchment that are something like 800,000 uh, litres each, uh, and they're not using them uh, a lot for reuse, so they're mainly full. But if we start working with them about how they can empty their tank and capture the water in, in an event scenario like we are going to do, between those two, we will get the, the one in year one in 20 year standard downstream in Booberry Street and that'll help further on as well. The broader strategy is to do decentralised systems, we haven't worked out quite how we're going to do that, but uh, rainwater tanks will be a key feature of it, I, um, is what the strategy is suggesting at this stage. So the concept that uh, Rod and his team came up with was a, a fairly large storage tank in Lincoln Square. Um, and then we spread out to some header tanks at the other two squares. So it's called Carlton Squares, because uh, there's three squares in Carlton. Um, and so Lincoln Square is the central one. We'll pump over to University Square when that gets uh, rejuvenated in the next couple of years. Um, and then eventually over to Argyle Square when, when we find the money and the need to, to do it over here as well. So at this stage, Lincoln Square is going to be irrigated. Uh, and the concept is mainly around just trapping the water, cleaning it through a GPT, pumping it up through uh, a treatment plant that will actually just have a physical screen and a UV filter, so no biological treatment at this stage. 
because we're using it for irrigation, um, and most of those nutrients will be applied to the landscape. And uh, contrary to um, what Rod and his team designed, when we went through the tender process, the contractor came up with this uh, concept of uh, using six round tanks uh, connected, uh, put all these up to try to explain what, what the scenario is. So they're 200 and something thousand litre tanks, no, 340, um, and they're connected at the base, and they're just fairly standard circular tanks. Cost-wise, it's about uh, similar to a large square system, but the advantage it gave us was that we could dig this hole pretty much one at a time um, and then backfill. So we didn't have to have a huge storage of soil on the, the roadway, which was quite a risk to, if it rain heavily, that could then potentially wash away. So basically we could dig a smaller hole and then backfill as, as we went. I think they kind of built uh, two at a time and then backfill, but essentially there was less uh, spoil to keep on, on site, which was, uh, cost-wise it was about cost-neutral, but risk-wise it was a lot less risky in our, from our perspective. And then the next graphic goes, I've already talked about this in terms of how the, the system will, will operate. So the main tank and then distributed to the, to the header tanks uh, and the treatments mainly a GPT, some sedimentation within the tank and then a simple filtration and UV. The, um, I guess the smarts that uh, um, Rod will talk about more is that we're already um, uh, through through uh, the internet, uh, control our irrigation system remotely, um, and that will happen here as well. And we were talking about whether we link it, link this purging to that system. It's not going to be the same system, but it, it's a similar style. Where basically someone somewhere will get a signal and say, uh, "I'm about to do this. Uh, what do you think?" And then if they say no, we can change it. But generally, it's automated, but remote messaging and remote control of this, the system. And we already have the, the smarts to do that. Uh, and yes, I guess the purging is, um, basically we're, we're filling the tanks usually, but then in a prior to rain event, we want to let the water go. And again, this is the, the banjo being up the hill. There's gravities on your side, so literally we're just opening a valve and letting it go. In the other systems, if we want to do them, uh, because they're at the bottom of the catchment and quite low down, uh, we have to pump them out, so there's a huge pumping cost to it, whereas here we pretty much just open a valve. Uh, that's some of the numbers around the irrigation efficiency that we're, we're trying to uh, achieve, looking at the various sizes. So there was some internal information um, that we provided to, to Storm on that. Uh, and that's calibrated with, uh, with their, their work. And at this point, Rod probably needs to jump in in terms of what this, uh, this graph says. Um, the, uh, the other interesting thing that we're finding is that um, generally, with this sort of information, um, we're trying to be conservative here, but uh, I am finding, and I just had the conversation the other day with my irrigation manager, that even though we're being conservative at this stage, when we're actually in operation, often we're finding that if we're only getting half of this sort of yield. So it's probably a research project that we need to undertake in the future as to, even though we're, we're using conservative numbers and, and low rainfall numbers, in, in operating these systems, if, if the yield is half, uh, that obviously will, will decrease the business case quite significantly. Um, so I think that's something we need to work on in, in the future. But if you want to talk to this, Greg. Thanks, Ralph. Um, just to follow up on it, Tommy, just put your hand up, Tommy. Tommy, up the back there. Tommy's going to talk about that very subject tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. I see what you moved. <laughs> so we're on that screen and it's telling you what's coming next. Right, okay. So this graph basically just shows the variability in rainfall and the impact it can have on yields. So um, we normally classify our years as dry years or average years, but in, in an average year, you can have a low yield. In a dry year, you can actually have a high yield. Um, so it's just highly variable, and it's something to to watch out for in the in the modelling. I'm going to try this little gizmo. Yeah, that's okay. Um, just I'm going to run through this fairly quickly because I want to get onto the purging stuff. Um, but this one is just a comparison of the, of the tank size um, for the dry and median year. 
and we looked at one to three megalitre tanks. You can see there's not a lot of difference between the two and the three megalitre tanks. Space was a real premium here. So, you know, it, the, the modelling showed that we're better off sticking with the two megalitre system. That's all that's about. And this is a modelling for a suboptimal condition and what the yield would be or the reliability, which is on the y axis there. So, Jess did a lot of modelling on this, didn't you, Jess? Um, so, she had a lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of big days on this. And it just showed that uh, the suboptimal condition is where the uh, purging is undertaken, but the tank is not, or the valve is not closed uh, during that storm to refill it. It's basically drained completely. When everything stops raining and it's dry, then the valve's closed and it waits, waits for the next event. Um, this is the one I kind of wanted to focus on. This is a benchmark where we started from. So it's been a progression from feasibility through to functional design and then detailed design and then the, the purging analysis where a lot of detailed modelling has been undertaken. Um, so this is the uh, peak flow analysis on what we expected the system to perform in terms of um, uh, flood mitigation. So the key one to look at there, I suppose, is a two me uh, megalitre tank column. And for the 20 year, that was the target event that we're looking at. And there's a reduction in, um, in peak flows there of 33%, 32.8. But more importantly, it's the overland flow reduction. So that's the one kind of focused on, even though it's not bolded. So that's 46%. So that the overland flow was basically cut in half, which is, which is a pretty good outcome. So that's done on design storms. What we're going to look at later is actually on real storms. So this is the, the crux of what I wanted to cover. That's the, um, the outline that I want to cover fairly quickly. So we talked about maximising the flood medication, but without compromising on stormwater harvesting. So what Ralph did share with you was a conversation before that. This actually started out a stormwater harvesting project in the feasibility, but it pretty quickly flipped around and it became a flood mitigation project but we still want, didn't want to compromise the stormwater harvesting, and they're at odds with each other. For flood mitigation, you want airspace, but for stormwater harvesting, you want all that full of water, of course. So um, there was a lot of, um, I suppose, naval gazing uh, to begin with because we're trying to develop the actual protocols of how this should open, how the, how the purging should work, um, so that it made the most of both opportunities to maximise the, the flood mitigation but also um, maximise the potential for harvesting. So we had to work out what the algorithms would actually be so then they could be coded and with the various inputs um, so they could manage these floods and it's the analogy that I took from this is many years ago now, more than I care to admit, um, I've been involved in uh, flood management of large storages. But these are water supply storages, massive things. And I remember you know, staying awake all night, you ring up the gauging stations and you get the blips and you find out how much water's coming down the catchment, you work out how full your dam is, so then you work out how far you've got to open your, open your gates and then who you're going to flood downstream. You want the phone to ring them up and you get out. Um, so a similar principle, but how do we make that work on a small scale like this? Um, so we had to identify what these uh, potential points uh, were and of time. And it was basically before storm and during the storm. So before storm to make that airspace, and then during the storm to actually make sure that that storage remained full after it stopped raining. So it's a pre-rain airspace. That's pretty straightforward, and that's actually achieved by um, rainfall prediction by the bomb. Um, so I've been working with um, Hydroterra there to um, basically engage or scrape the data from the bomb website and there's a key trigger that we had to work out what it was. This amount of rainfall on this catchment would result in the activation of flood mitigation, flood management, in other words purging. Then during the storm, after you go through this process a few times, you work out that it's the pre-peak airspace, the post-peak airspace, and then a rainfall threshold for, for closing the valve again. So these aren't all thought of at the start. This is something that you've got to work your way through and feel your way through. So, you know, with the last one, the rainfall threshold to close being the last one developed, and I'll hopefully explain why. Um, so the key performance indicators is that overland flow reduction, like I talked about before. 
then the stormwater harvesting one was the basically the water level in the tank after the storm event had finished. So those are the two key things that we're looking at, and they're pretty good um, KPI for summing up what we're trying to achieve here in both those things. These are some flow charts quickly, um, how we want the thing to operate. Uh, and it basically comes down to a pre-rain coefficient, which is uh, critical to determining your, your airspace target. I apologise, I've got to go through this quickly. This is the pre-peak flow charts. This is basically how it works. Calculates the amount of runoff that's expected down through the, that catchment uh, based on rainfall depth, which is based on a lot of modelling. Um, and then it's got a pre-peak coefficient there in yellow. The yellow ones are the key ones, the key variables that we're trying to actually work out here. And then it makes a decision whether to open the valve or close the valve. And then this next one is post-peak. So anything that really changes there is that post-peak coefficient. That's different. So how do we work all this out? Well, we've got 50 storms. And we were working off the, um, the actual storms that occurred in our data set. We had well, you can see how many years there are, over 100 years of data. Um, so that's the breakdown in which we had. But I kept six design storms in there because they're the design storms that we originally um, uh, calculated the performance of. That's just a quick plot of them, so I won't spend any time on that. But it's using a lot of data, particularly when you're trying to work out what all these, the impact of each one of these variables has. So there's four key. Um, uh, algorithms that we needed to develop, and there's 50 storms, so you can imagine the data that was produced. So the uh, quantity uh, drains, the ILSEX uh, model, was used to generate the uh, runoff data. They're the, um, basically the calculations, um, so you've got pre-rain, airspace, pre-peak, and so on, and just the algorithms that we use, which actually creates, uh, informs the assumptions about the uh, overland flows. So they can be read later. Your, uh, your discretion. This is the um, runoff calculation. So I've got a whole bunch of storms here and uh, put them in so we can develop up an algorithm to estimate what the runoff volume is that's coming down from this catchment. So that's really important in determining what that, how, how much uh, airspace we should, we should be creating in the tank. Then we started looking at all these coefficients. Uh, pre-rain coefficient 10, 20, up to 100%. So I just want to explain what coefficient is. Coefficient is the multiple used for the expected um, runoff that's to occur in that catchment to the tank. Okay? So a coefficient of 10% means that we're going to make 10% airspace available compared to the volume of uh, runoff that's expected in that catchment. Does that make sense? This means yes? Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's a few of them. So you can see all the combinations here. Um, they're starting to get a lot of data. So it's basically a Monte Carlo assessment that had to be used. And that's what these plots are. Let me just go back. Um, so what we're trying to achieve here, these are split up in a different rainfall depth, so those different charts. What we're essentially trying to achieve is push it up into the right-hand corner of that graph. Okay? If those dots aren't up in the right-hand corner of the graph, we're not optimising the performance. Okay? So the, the x-axis along the bottom is the final tank volume. So right the way on the right-hand side, that means it's full after the event. Okay? If it's not there, then it's, we're not capitalising on the, on the harvesting. Uh, and pushing it up towards the top means that we're having we're reducing the overland uh, flows okay, down the road. So here we've got dots all over the place. So you can see there's a lot of combinations of these variables that just they don't work very well overall. We need to push that up in the corner. So it was a matter of refining it then. This was phase two, so we narrowed the scope of the pre-rain uh, in particular. So we're getting closer. You can see the change in the dots. We've seen them focus up in the right-hand corner. And the last one is the rainfall um, threshold depth for closing the valve. So you can see on that top graph there, top right, the orange line, is it the orange up there? Or oh, the red line, I should say. I wish I could point, but I can't. The red line up there <coughs> goes up. So the storage is full. It starts off pretty empty. You can see because the purging's already happened, pre-rainfall. And it's gone, hello, I need to get rid of this water, and it dumps it. It gets full, 
but then it drops back down again. So you, that's where the valve is not closing early enough, and that's where we're, aha, we need to introduce a some sort of close algorithm here. And so that's what we did. So we added a close algorithm, and it keeps it full. And that threshold is 10 mil in this case. So we put all this, and the final one is, um, is the, the, those values there, so these are the values that's getting um, coded currently into the PLCs. With the data input, okay, the first data input is the, is the pre-rain, so that's taking it straight from the bomb. When it starts raining, it's pre-peak and that's post-peak. So the data that's being fed into it is the tipping bucket on the site and the storage level. Okay? And with those two inputs, um, we, can, we can estimate uh, what's going to come down the catchment, and we can estimate or make a recommendation on what the target airspace is. So you can see, if you recall the previous graphs, you had a bit more of a scatter here. It's really focused up on the right-hand side with a more of a concentration in the upper portion. So over on the right-hand side means it's performing really well for stormwater harvesting. And having it up a bit you know, means that it's performing well for uh, detention. So you can see some of the dots are down. And they're the ones where we're having less of an impact on the um, overland flows that report downstream of here. So it's showing that a lot of events that we've chosen, it, it doesn't manage the whole event, which is fine because I can't. There's, there's 100 year events in here, for instance. Um, there's a little demonstration here that um, I, I won't go into, but this. This graphical output was the key, um, the key, I suppose, presentation to a particular council staff on how it works. So each time we flick through the storm, it didn't really matter what the recurrence interval is, we just picked the top 50 biggest one. We did put a recurrence interval on it. It just showed how each one of them performed. So I just want to describe it now. So you've already got an idea of the red line. The red line is, is the storage height, <coughs> and the, um, the axis up here uh, notes that. Along the x-axis is the uh, time, and the y-axis is the flow in cubic metres a second. So the yellow one is the upstream overland flow. So you can see you've got quite a lot of upstream overland flow. The blue one, the darker blue one, is the downstream overland flow. So you can see immediately the impact that this uh, system has had on that particular storm. I can't remember what this one is. So it's not dealing with the whole lot. It is reducing it by, uh, well, 40%, something like that. But it is not eliminating it in this case. The light blue one is what continues to flow down the, the pipe. So that's already been in the pipe, so it's not on the road. We call it a bypass. And then the grey one is the discharge out. So that's when you open up your valve after it starts raining. And you see there's not an element lot here. So that's graph for every single one. Um, just on that, what became evident was that it's, it's if everyone's tried, anyone's tried to estimate what the recurrence interval of a particular storm is, you know, once you start getting your head right into it, it starts to get a bit challenging because no two storms are the same, they're all different. Now, the nice ones to work with are the design storms, of course. That's why I threw some of them in there. But in some of these, they would be ranked um, probably less than a 20 year. Uh, or around about the 20 year, and the system sometimes didn't have much impact on it because it's the way the rain fell. Okay, and that case would be where you don't have a lot of rain up front, but then you get a big slug right at the end of the storm event. And there's even some um, 50 to 100 year events that perform brilliantly. Okay, so it's really hard to nail down and say, oh, yeah, the system here has been designed for a 20 year event, it's all perfect. Well, it might work out for a Design storm to be nice and perfect, but in the real world, it's a different story. So you get that varying rainfall, so you get the varying performance. So it just depends, but I'll say that. Um, how's my time, Andy? Okay, this is just a quick sensitivity analysis on what if we get it wrong? What if we underestimate the rainfall runoff by 50%, plus or minus? And so we just plotted that up. We found essentially that. 50% uh, really didn't make much difference. So that gave us a fair bit of comfort uh, that if we estimated it incorrectly, um, like if we 
underestimated the, the rainfall, for instance, by 50%, it's not going to have a big impact. By the time that rain starts falling and the adjustments are made, it's going to make a lot of difference. If we get it wrong by more than about 55, that's where it starts having an impact here. So that just gave us a bit, a bit of comfort in that respect, that these variables can be changed, of course. So just in summary, uh, protocols are developed for dual function, but the primary one is the flood mitigation. The pre-rain air space target is 50%, which was found um, most reliable. So the, the, the really big events where a lot of rainfall is predicted, it's going to mean that the storage imp is in one. Okay, so we can't be too hung up on that one. And the, the pre-peak air space, so this is when the floods actually operated, we're going for a, um, a 75% target there. And, um, sorry, the, the pre-peak, and then the post-peak 25% and that rainfall threshold depth of 10 millimetres. So if there's less than 10 millimetres, in this case it falls in 30 minutes. Shut that valve down so you can keep that water. So in rainfall depths of um, less than 50 millimetres, that's where it was most effective. Um, as I said, it wasn't really sensitive for a 50, up to 50% area error. When you get more than 8 millimetres in 6 minutes, this is produced a lot of overland flow. And just wanted to clarify that this tank can only get water, or it can only fill, from the pipe itself. Okay? So it's not a matter of if you get these overland flows coming down on the road and they magically somehow disappear in the tank, they don't. It's a matter of taking all that water from the upstream pipe only, which then creates opportunity for those overland flows to get into the pipe system. Right, finished. Thank you very much.